Section 1 of My Life in Christ Extracts from the Diary of St. John of Kronstadt Part 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org My Life in Christ by St. John of Kronstadt Translated by E. E. Gulyov, Section 1 I do not precede my book by any introduction. Let it speak for itself. Everything contained in it is but a gracious enlightenment, which was bestowed upon my soul by the all-enlightening Holy Ghost during moments of deep self-concentration and of self-examination, especially during prayer. When I had time, I noted down the edifying thoughts and feelings that came to me, and from these notes, continued for many years, this book has now been compiled. The contents are very varied, as will be seen by the readers. Let them judge of them for themselves. He that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. 1 Corinthians 2.15 This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. St. John 17.3 Thou, O God, hast opened wide to me thy truth and thy verity. By instructing me in the sciences, thou hast opened to me all the riches of faith, of nature, and of human understanding. I have learned thy word, the word of God, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. I have studied the laws regulating the mind of man, its love of wisdom, the formation and the beauty of speech, I have penetrated in part into the mysteries of nature, into her laws, into the abyss of the creation of worlds and their revolution. I know the population of the terrestrial globe. I have acquainted myself with its different peoples, with the celebrated persons and their works, who have passed in turn through this world. I have in part studied the great science of self-knowledge, and of how to draw nigh to thee. In a word, I have become cognizant of many, many things. For more things are showed unto thee than men understand, and hereafter I shall yet learn much. I have many books of very varied contents. I have read and re-read them, but still I am not yet satisfied. My spirit still thirsts for further knowledge, and my heart is unsatisfied. It hungers, and from all the knowledge thus acquired by the intellect, it cannot gain full happiness. When will it be satisfied? It will be satisfied when I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Until then I shall hunger. Whosoever drinketh of this water of worldly wisdom shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life, said the Lord. How is it that the saints see us and our needs and hear our prayers? Let us make the following comparison. Suppose that you were transplanted to the sun and were united to it. The sun lights the whole earth with its rays. It lights every particle of the earth. In these rays you also see the earth, but you are so small in proportion to the sun that you would form, so to say, but one ray, and there are an infinite number of such rays. By its identity with the sun, this ray takes an intimate part in lighting the whole world through the sun. So also the saintly soul, having become united to God as to its spiritual sun, sees through the medium of its spiritual sun, which lights the whole universe, all men, and the needs of those that pray. 
Have you learned to see God and represent Him to yourself as the omnipresent wisdom, as the living, acting Word, as the vivifying Holy Spirit? The Holy Scripture is the domain of wisdom, Word, and Spirit, of God in the Trinity. In it He clearly manifests Himself. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life, said the Lord. The writings of the Holy Fathers are again the expression of the mind, word, and spirit of the Holy Trinity, in which the spirit of the higher class, spiritually speaking, of mankind, has largely participated. The writings of ordinary worldly men are the expression of the fallen spirit of men, with all their sinful attachments, habits, and passions. In the Holy Scriptures we see God face to face, and ourselves as we are. Man, know thyself through them, and walk always as in the presence of God. As you are aware, man, in his words, does not die. He is immortal in them, and they will speak after his death. I shall die, but shall speak even after my death. How many immortal words are in use amongst the living, which were left by those who have died long ago, and which sometimes still live in the mouths of a whole people? How powerful is the word even of an ordinary man! Still more so is the word of God. It will live throughout all ages, and will always be living and acting. As God is the creative, living, and life-giving wisdom, therefore those greatly sin who, by the thoughts of their spirit, turn aside from the wisdom of the Trinity, and occupy themselves with material, perishable things, thus materializing their spirit itself. Especially do those sin who, during divine service in church, or during their prayers at home, entirely turn aside in their thoughts from God, and allow their minds to wander in different places outside the church. By doing so they greatly offend God, upon whom on such occasions our minds should be fixed. To what end do fasting and penitence lead? For what purpose is this trouble taken? They lead to the cleansing of the soul from sins, to peace of heart, to union with God. They fill us with devotion and sonship, and give us boldness before God. There are, indeed, very important reasons for fasting and for confession from the whole heart. There shall be an inestimable reward given for conscientious labor. Have many of us the feeling of sun-like love to God? Dare many of us, without condemnation, and with boldness call upon the Father in heaven and say, Our Father? Is there not, on the contrary, no such sun-like voice to be heard in our hearts, which are deadened by the vanities of this world, and attachments to its objects and pleasures? Is not our Heavenly Father far from our hearts? Is it not rather an avenging God that we should represent to ourselves? we who have withdrawn ourselves from him into a faraway land. Yes, by our sins all of us are worthy of his righteous anger and punishment, and it is wonderful how long-suffering and forbearing he is to us, that he does not strike us like the barren fig trees. Let us hasten to propitiate him by repentance and tears. Let us enter into ourselves. Let us consider our unclean hearts in all strictness, and when we see what a multitude of impurities are keeping them from the reach of divine grace, we shall ourselves acknowledge that we are spiritually dead. The loving Lord is here. How can I let even a shadow of evil enter into my heart? Let all evil completely die within me. Let my heart be anointed with the sweet fragrance of goodness as with a balsam. Let God's love conquer thee, thou evil Satan, instigating us, 
who are evil by nature, too evil. Evil is most hurtful both to the mind and to the body. It burns, it crushes, and it tortures. No one bound by evil shall dare to approach the throne of the God of love. When praying, we must absolutely subject our heart to our will, and turn it towards God. It must be neither cold, crafty, untruthful, nor double-minded. Otherwise, what will be the use of our prayers, of our preparation for the sacrament? It is good for us to hear God's voice of anger. This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoureth me with their lips but their heart is far from me. So do not let us stand in church in a state of spiritual prostration, but let the spirit of each one of us on such occasions burn in its working towards God. Even men do not much value the services which we render to them coldly, out of habit. And God requires our hearts. My son, give me thine heart because the heart is the principal part of the man, his life. More than this, the heart is the man himself. Thus, he who does not pray, or does not serve God with his heart, does not pray at all, because in that case his body only prays, and the body without the mind is nothing more than earth. Remember that when standing in prayer, you stand before God himself, who has the wisdom of all. Therefore your prayer ought to be, so to say, all spirit, all understanding. The saints of God live even after their death. Thus I often hear in church the Mother of God singing her wonderful, heart-penetrating song, which she said in the house of her cousin Elizabeth after the Annunciation of the Archangel. At times I hear the song of Moses, the song of Zacharias, the father of the forerunner, that of Hannah, the mother of the prophet Samuel, that of the three children, and that of Miriam. And how many holy singers of the New Testament delight until now the ear of the whole church of God, and the divine service itself, the sacraments, the rites. Whose spirit is there? moving and touching our hearts, that of God and of his saints. Here is a proof for you of the immortality of men's souls. How is it that all these men have died, and yet are governing our lives after their death? They are dead, and they still speak, instruct, and touch us. As the breath is necessary for the body, and as without breathing men cannot live, so likewise the soul cannot truly live without the breath of God's Spirit. As air is necessary for the body, so is the Holy Ghost for the soul. Air has some likeness to the Holy Ghost. As the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. When you are threatened with temptation to sin, then represent to yourself vividly that sin is exceedingly displeasing to God, who hates iniquity. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. And in order to understand this better, imagine a father, righteous and severe, who loves his family, and is trying by every means to make his children well-principled and upright in order to reward them afterwards for their good behavior by the great riches he has laboriously laid up for them, and who nevertheless sees, to his grief, that the children, disregarding their father's love, do not love him, do not pay attention to the inheritance so lovingly prepared for them by their father, but live disorderly, and rush impetuously to destruction. Mark that sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death, because it kills the soul, because it makes us the slaves of the devil, 
the destroyer of men. And the more we work for sin, the more difficult will be our return, and the more sure will be our ruin. Dread, therefore, every sin with the whole heart. When your heart inclines to evil, and the evil one begins to undermine your heart, so that it is completely removed from the rock of faith, then say to yourself inwardly, I know of my spiritual poverty, my own nothingness without faith. I am so weak, that it is only by Christ's name that I live and obtain peace, that I rejoice and my heart expands, whilst without him I am spiritually dead, I am troubled, and my heart is oppressed. Without the Lord's cross I should have been long since the victim of the most cruel distress and despair. Only Christ keeps me alive, and the cross is my peace and my consolation. We are all able to think, because an unlimited wisdom, thought, exists, just as we are able to breathe, because unlimited air spaces exist. This is the reason why bright ideas upon any subject are called inspirations. Our thoughts are constantly flowing conditionally with the existence of the unlimited spirit of wisdom, thought. This is why the Apostle says, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. This is also why the Saviour himself says, Take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that hour what ye shall speak. Thus you see that the thought, and even the word itself, the inspiration, come to us from without. This, of course, in a state of grace, and in cases of need. But even in our ordinary state, all our bright thoughts come from our guardian angel and from God's Spirit, whilst, on the contrary, impure, dark thoughts proceed from our corrupt nature and from the devil, ever lying in wait for us. How, then, should the Christian behave? God himself worketh in us. In general, throughout the world we see the kingdom of thought in the structure of the whole visible world as also in particular in the earth, in the rotation and the life of the terrestrial globe, in the distribution of the elements, light, air, water, earth, fire concealed, whilst other elements are diffused in the animals, in birds, fishes, reptiles, beasts, and men, in their wise and ingenious construction, in their faculties, nature, and habits, in plants, in their construction, nourishment, etc. In a word, we see everywhere the kingdom of thought, even down to the lifeless stone and sand. Priest of God, learn how to turn the bed of sorrow of the Christian sufferer into one of joy by the consolation of faith. Learn how to make him, instead of, in his opinion, the most unfortunate, the happiest of men. Assure him that having been a little chastised, he shall be greatly rewarded afterwards, and you will be the friends of mankind, angels of consolation, instruments or ministers of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. If the fervor of faith in the heart is not sometimes stirred up, then in time, through negligence, faith may become entirely extinguished in us, and Christianity with its sacraments may entirely die for us. The enemy takes pains to attain this end, and tries to extinguish faith in our hearts, and to bury in oblivion all the truths of Christianity. This is why we see men who, being Christians, are only such in name, while by their actions they are quite heathen. Do not think that our faith is not vivifying to us, pastors, that we serve God hypocritically. No, we before all, and more than all, 
avail ourselves of God's mercies, and we know by experience what the Lord Himself is to us, His sacraments, His most pure mother, and His saints. For instance, in partaking of the life-giving mysteries of the blood and body of the Saviour, we often, often experience in ourselves their vivifying effect, the heavenly gifts of peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. We know that the gracious gaze of a king does not rejoice the heart of the least of his subjects as the merciful gaze of our heavenly Master, as his mysteries rejoice our hearts. And we should have been most unthankful to the Lord, and our hearts would indeed have been hardened, had we not tried to make known the glory of God's life-giving mysteries unto his beloved, had we not extolled his wonders, accomplished in our hearts during each celebration of the divine liturgy. We also experience the effect of the invincible, incomprehensible, divine power of the Lord's glorious and life-giving cross and by its power we drive away from our hearts evil passions, despondency, pusillanimity, fear, and other snares of the devil. The cross is our friend and benefactor. I say this sincerely, with full belief in the truth and power of these words. You wish to comprehend the incomprehensible, but can you understand how the inward sorrows with which your heart is overwhelmed overtake you, and can you find, except in the Lord, the means to drive them away? Learn at first, with your heart, how to free yourself from sorrows, how to ensure peace in your heart, and then, if necessary, philosophize on the incomprehensible. For if ye then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Whose wisdom appears in the construction of your body? Who has ordered the laws of your thoughts, so that until now these laws are followed by all men? Who has engraved in the hearts of all men the law of conscience, so that until now it rewards the good and punishes the evil in all men? The Almighty, all-wise, and most gracious God, Thy hand is constantly upon me, a sinner, and there is no moment when thy mercy leaves me. Grant me then always to kiss, with living faith, thy gracious hand. Why should I go far to seek for the traces of thy mercies, of thy wisdom, and thy omnipotence? Oh, how clearly these traces are visible to me! I, I myself, am a miracle of God's goodness, wisdom, omnipotence. I myself, on a small scale, am a whole world. My soul is the representative of the invisible world, my body of the visible one. Brethren, what is the purpose of our earthly life? It is that, after our trial by earthly affliction and misfortunes, and after our gradual advancement in virtue, by means of the divine gifts, given to us in the sacraments, we may rest, after our death, in the Lord, the peace of our souls. That is why we sing of the dead, Grant rest, O Lord, to the soul of thy departed servant. We wish him to rest in peace, as the limit of all wishes, and pray to God for this. Is it not, then, unwise to grieve much for the departed? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, says the Lord. Thus are departed ones, who have fallen asleep in a Christian death, come to this voice of God, and obtain rest. What is there, then, to grieve for? Those who are trying to lead a spiritual life have to carry on a most skillful and difficult warfare, through their thoughts every moment of their life, that is, a spiritual warfare. It is necessary that our whole soul should be every moment a clear eye, able to watch and notice the thoughts entering our heart from the evil one, and repel them. 
the hearts of such men should be always burning with faith humility and love otherwise subtlety of the devil finds an easy access to them followed by a diminution of faith or entire unbelief and then by every possible evil which it will be difficult to wash away even by tears do not therefore allow your heart to be cold especially during prayer and avoid in every way cold indifference very often it happens that prayer is on the lips but in the heart cunning incredulity or unbelief so that by the lips the man seems near to god whilst in his heart he is far from him. And during our prayers, the evil one makes use of every means to chill our hearts and fill them with deceit in a most imperceptible manner to us. Pray and fortify yourself. Fortify your heart. If you wish to ask of God in prayer any blessing for yourself, then before praying prepare yourself for undoubting and firm faith, and take in good time means against doubt and unbelief. For it will go ill with you if during the prayer itself your heart wavers in its faith and does not stand firm in it. Then do not even expect to obtain of the Lord what you have prayed for doubtingly, for in so doing you have offended the Lord, and God does not bestow his gifts upon a reviler. And all things, whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive said the lord this means that if you doubt and do not believe you shall not receive if ye have faith and doubt not said he also ye shall have power to move mountains therefore if you doubt and do not believe you shall not have power to do so let him ask in faith nothing wavering for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed, says the Apostle James. For let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. The heart that doubts that God can grant what it asks for is punished for this doubt. It is painfully oppressed and contracted by doubt. Do not anger Almighty God, even by a shade of doubt, especially you, who have already experienced many and many times the omnipotence of God. Doubt is a blasphemy against God, an insolent lie of the heart, or of the lying spirit that nestles in the heart, against the spirit of truth. Fear it as you would fear a venomous serpent, or no, what I would rather say is, despise it, do not take the slightest heed of it. Remember that God, during your prayer, is waiting for your affirmative answer to the question which he is inwardly asking you. Believe ye that I am able to do this? To which question you must from the depth of your heart reply, Yea, Lord, let the following considerations also help you in your doubt or unbelief. I ask of God firstly, that which already exists, and nothing merely imaginary, not a fanciful good. And everything that exists received its being from God, because without Him was not anything made that was made. And therefore, nothing that happens can happen without Him, and everything has either received its being from Him, or happens by His will or His permission, by means of powers and faculties given by him to his creatures, and in everything that exists or is still happening, God is an all-powerful master. Besides this, he calleth those things which be not as though they were. Therefore, had I even asked for that which does not exist, he could give it to me by creating it. Secondly, I ask of God what is possible because what is impossible for us is possible for God. And there cannot be any difficulty even in this respect, because God can do for me even that which is impossible in my own opinion. It is our misfortune that our faith is hindered by the short-sightedness of our reason, that spider, 
that catches the truth in the web of its judgments, its arguments and analogies. Faith embraces and sees suddenly, whilst reason arrives at the truth by circuitous ways. Faith is the means of communication between one spirit and another, whilst reason is the means of communication between the spiritually sensual and the spiritually sensual, and even simply material. The first is the spirit, and the latter the flesh. All the blessings of the soul, that is, all that constitutes the true life, the peace and the joy of the soul, come from God. This I have proved by experience. My heart tells me so. Thou, O Holy Ghost, art a treasury of blessings. Having Christ in your heart, fear that you may lose Him, and with Him the peace of your heart. It is hard to begin again. Efforts to attach oneself afresh to Him after falling away will be very grievous, and will cost bitter tears to many. Cling to Christ with all your might, gain Him, and do not lose boldness in approaching Him. You gaze upon the icon of the Saviour, and see that He looks at you from it with brightest eyes. This look is the image of how He actually looks upon you with His eyes, that are brighter than the sun, and sees all your thoughts, hears all your heartfelt distress and sighs. The image is an image, and represents in lines and signs that which cannot be delineated, cannot be given in signs, and can be comprehended by faith alone. Believe, then, that the Saviour always protects you and sees each one of you with all your thoughts, sorrows, and sighing, in all your circumstances, is upon the palm of the hand. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me, says the Lord God. How much consolation and life are contained in these gracious words of the Almighty and Provident God. Therefore pray before the icon of the Saviour as before Himself. The lover of men is present in it by His grace, and with the eyes depicted in it rarely looks at you. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, while with His ears, as represented on the icon, He hears you. But remember that His eyes are the eyes of God, and His ears are the ears of the omnipresent God. In the well-intentioned works of men, esteem the light of Christ, the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world, and read them with love, thanking the light-giving Christ, who so richly bestows his light upon those who are zealous for the glory of his name. Wherever I am, as soon as I raise the eyes of my heart in my affliction to God, the lover of men immediately answers my faith and prayer, and the sorrow immediately departs. He is at every time, at every hour near me, only I do not see it, but I feel it vividly in my heart. Sorrow is the death of the heart, and it is a falling away from God. The expansion, the peace of heart through lively faith in Him, prove more clearly than the day that God is constantly present near me, and that He dwells within me. What intercessor or angel can set us free from our sins or sorrows? None but God alone. This is from experience. End of section 1section two of my life in christ by st john of kronstadt translated by e e gulioff this librivox recording is in the public domain let us measure the worth of our prayers by human measure or by the quality of our relation to other men how do we behave to other people sometimes we express our request praises and gratitude to them coldly, heartlessly, out of duty, 
or simply out of politeness, and it is the same when we do anything for them, whilst at other times we do so with warmth, heartily and lovingly, often only feigning, often really sincerely. We are similarly unequal with God, but this should not be. We must always, from our whole hearts, sing and express to God our praises, our gratitude and our request. Every work must be done before Him with the whole heart. He must be loved and trusted with the whole heart. Faith in God's existence is closely connected with faith in the existence of our own souls, as a part of the spiritual world. God's existence is as evident to the pious mind as its own being, because every thought, good or bad, every desire, every intention, word or act of such a mind is followed by a corresponding change in the state of the heart, peace or trouble, joy or grief, and this is the result of the action upon it of the God of spirits and bodies, who is reflected in the pious mind as the sun is reflected in a drop of water. The purer the drop is, the better, the clearer will be the reflection. The more turbid the drop, the dimmer will be the reflection. So that in the soul's state of extreme impurity or darkness, the reflection entirely ceases, and the soul is left in a state of spiritual darkness, in a state of insensibility. In this state the man having eyes sees not, and having ears hears not. Again, in relation to our souls, God may be likened to the outer air in relation to the mercury of the thermometer, with this difference, that the expansion and rest, rise and fall of the mercury proceed from the change in the state of the atmosphere, whilst in the first case God remains unchangeable, everlasting and eternally good and just, whilst the soul, changeable in its relation to God, suffers changes in itself, thus it unavoidably expands and obtains peace of heart when it draws nearer to God by faith and good works, and unavoidably contracts, becomes restless and wearied, when it withdraws itself from God by unlawful acts, want of faith, and unbelief in God's truth. The evil spirit tries to scatter prayer as if it were a sand heap, tries to turn the words into dry sand without coherency or moisture, that is to say, without fervor of heart. Thus prayer may become either a house built on sand or a house built on a rock. Those built on sand who pray without faith, absently, coldly, such prayer is scattered of itself, and does not bring any profit to him who prays. Those build on a rock who, during the whole time of their prayer, have their eyes fixed upon God, and pray to Him as to a living person, conversing face to face with them. Edifying words, the writings of the Holy Fathers, prayers, and especially the words of the Word Himself, the second person of the Holy Trinity, are indeed living water. Water runs, and the words flow like water. Water refreshes and gives life to the body, and edifying words animate the soul, filling it with peace and joy, or with compunction and contrition for sin. Our hope of obtaining that which we ask for during prayer is founded upon faith in God's mercy and bountifulness. For He is the God of mercy and bountifulness, and the lover of men. Therefore, at that time, it is useful to remind ourselves of former innumerable experiences of mercy and grace bestowed upon men, in holy writ and in the lives of the saints, and upon ourselves. Besides this, in order that prayer may be effectual, it is also necessary that those who pray should have already obtained that which they formerly asked for, and firmly believe this with their whole heart. 
we often receive through prayer that which we have asked for, especially when we pray for that which relates to the salvation of our soul. It is necessary to ascribe this directly to God and His grace, and not to chance. How can there possibly be any chance in the kingdom of the Almighty God? Nothing can really happen without His will, as without Him was not anything made that hath been made. Many do not pray, because it seems to them that they did not receive any gift from God when they prayed before, or because they consider praying unnecessary. They say that God knows everything without our asking, and forget that it is said, Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Our requests, prayers, are necessary expressly to strengthen our faith, through which alone can we be saved. By grace are we saved through faith. O woman, great is thy faith. For this reason the Lord made the woman pray earnestly, in order to awaken her faith and to strengthen it. Such men do not see that they have no faith, the Christian's most precious inheritance which is as necessary as life itself, that they make him a liar by their unbelief, and that they are the children of the devil, unworthy of any of God's mercies, that they are going to destruction. It is also necessary that our hearts should burn during prayer with a desire for spiritual blessings, with love to God, and that we should vividly represent to ourselves his extreme mercy to mankind, and his readiness to hear all our prayers with fatherly love. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? God, being the eternal truth, does not suffer in us even a moment of doubt in the truth. God, as the eternal mercy, will have all men to be saved, and to come into the knowledge of the truth. And we, the children of the merciful God, also must wish with our whole hearts that all men, and even our enemies, should be saved, and must care for this. Watch your heart during all your life. Examine it. Listen to it and see what prevents its union with the most blessed Lord. Let this be for you the science of all sciences, and with God's help you will easily observe what estranges you from God, and what draws you towards Him and unites you to Him. It is the evil spirit more than anything that stands between our hearts and God. He estranges God from us by various passions, or by the desires of the flesh by the desires of the eyes, and by worldly pride. Why should it be wonderful if God himself, the creator of all things visible and invisible, transforms, transubstantiates bread and wine into his own most pure body, and his own most pure blood? In these, in the bread and wine, the Son of God does not become again incarnate, for he was already once incarnate, and this is sufficient unto endless ages. But he is incarnate in the very same flesh in which he was before incarnate, in the same manner as he multiplied the five loaves and fed with these five loaves several thousands of people. There are a great many mysteries in nature which my mind cannot grasp, although they have concrete forms, yet they exist with their mysteries. So also in the sacrament of the life-giving body and blood, it is a mystery for me, how the bread and wine are made into the body and blood of the Lord himself. But the mystery of the body and blood really exists, although it is incomprehensible to me. My Creator, I am only his clay, for God formed me of flesh and blood and endued me with a spirit. As the most wise, the infinitely almighty God 
has innumerable mysteries. I myself am a mystery, as the work of his hands. For my soul there is the Spirit of the Lord, and for my soul and body there are his body and blood. In the same way as the soul carries its body, so God carries the whole universe, all the worlds, being himself more vast than they are. The soul fills the whole body, and the Spirit of the Lord filleth the world. Only the soul is limited by the body, though not completely, as it may be born everywhere. And the Spirit of the Lord is not limited by the universe, and is not contained in the world, as the soul is in the body. Christ, being led into the heart by faith, dwells in it with peace and joy. It is not without reason that it is said of God, He is holy, and rests in the saints. Do not forget yourself in looking upon the beauty of the human face, but look upon the soul. Do not look upon the man's garment, the body being his temporary garment, but look upon him who is clothed in it. Do not admire the magnificence of the mansion, but look upon the dweller who lives in it and what he is. Otherwise you will offend the image of God in the man, will dishonor the king by worshipping his servant, and not rendering unto him even the least of the honor due to him. Also, do not look upon the beauty of the printing of a book, but look upon the spirit of the book. Otherwise you will depreciate the spirit and exalt the flesh. For the letters are the flesh, and the contents of the book the spirit. Do not be allured by the melodious sounds of an instrument or of a voice, but by their effect upon the soul, or by the words of the song, consider what their spirit is. If the sounds produce upon your soul tranquil, chaste, holy feelings, then listen to them, and feed your soul with them. Whilst, if they give rise in your soul to passions, then leave off listening to them, and throw aside both the flesh and the spirit of the music. The inner man, amidst worldly vanity, amidst the darkness of his flesh, is not so bound by the temptations of the evil one, and looks out more freely early in the morning, just after waking up, like a fish, which sometimes throws itself up playfully on the surface of the water. All the remaining time he is enveloped in almost impenetrable darkness. His eyes are covered by a bandage, which conceals from him the true state of things spiritual and physical. Take advantage of these morning hours, which are the hours of a new life, or of a life renewed by temporary sleep. They show us in part that state in which we shall be when we shall rise up renewed on that great and universal morning of the nightless day of resurrection, or when we shall rid ourselves of this mortal body. Even during prayer, man is for the greater part not the son of freedom, but the slave of necessity and duty. Look at any man you like, even at a priest. Do many of them pray with a free, expanded heart, with living faith and love? During prayer there sometimes occur moments of deadly darkness and spiritual anguish arising from unbelief of the heart, for unbelief is darkness. Do not let your heart fail you at such moments, but remember that if the divine light has been sent off in you, it always shines in all its splendor and greatness in God himself, in God's church, in heaven and on earth and in the material world in which his eternal power and Godhead are visible. Do not think that truth has failed, because truth is God himself, and everything that exists has its foundation and reason in him. Only your own weak, sinful, and darkened heart can fail in the truth, for it cannot always bear the strength of the light of truth, and is not always capable of containing its purity, 
but only it is being, or has been, purified from its sins, as the first cause of spiritual darkness. The proof of this you may find in yourself. When the light of faith or God's truth dwells in your heart, only then is it tranquil, firm, strong, and living. But when this is cut off, then your heart becomes uneasy, weak as a reed shaken by the wind, and lifeless. Do not pay any attention to this darkness of Satan. Drive it away from your heart by making the sign of the life-giving cross. Do not spare yourself, but pray earnestly, even if you have been toiling all day. Do not be negligent in holy prayer. Say it to God unto the end from your whole heart, for it is a duty you owe to God. Having put your hand to the plough, do not look back. If you allow yourself to pray carelessly, and not from your heart, you will not fall asleep, if you pray at night, until you have wiped out by tears your sin before God. This is not so with everybody, however, but only with the more perfect. Take care, then, not to put your flesh before God, and disdain, for his sake, bodily repose. If you have made a rule to read so many prayers, whether they be long or short, fulfill the reading of all of them well. Read the prayers with all conscientiousness, and do not do God's work with your heart divided in two, so that only one half belongs to Him, and the remaining half to your own flesh. God is a jealous God, and will not suffer your duplicity, your self-pity. He will deliver you up to the devil, and the devil will not let your heart rest for your neglect of God, who is the true peace of your heart, and who will always do that which is for your own good, so as to keep your heart near him. For every insincere prayer removes your heart from God, and sets it in opposition to you yourself, whilst every earnest prayer draws your heart nearer to God, and makes it perpetually godly. Thus be assured, if you hurry over your prayers to give rest to your body, you will lose both spiritual and bodily rest. Oh, by what labor, sweat, and tears is the approach of our heart to God gained! Is it possible that we should again make our very prayers, when careless, the means of our estrangement from God, and that God should not be jealous of this? For he pities us in our former labors, and he desires that we should again unfailingly turn to him with our whole hearts. He wishes that we would always belong to him. Without God, without his omnipresence, there cannot be any single motion of my thought or heart. If there is an action, there must be a reason. If there is a consequence, there must be an origin. This is why the Apostle says, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves, capable, to think anything is of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. God himself lives, and that is why my soul also lives. If my life were prolonged only for a few moments, let us say ten, and five of these ten were moments of peace and quietness, and the remaining five moments of pain and torments, even then I ought undoubtedly to say, Surely the giver of life is with me, and he will provide for me. Likewise I undoubtedly ought to say, There is a being in the world who has the power of death, because the five unfavorable moments must proceed from the being that works against God, for the same cause cannot produce opposite actions. And in me, sinner as I am, at least seventy parts of my spiritual life belong to God, and only thirty parts to the devil. How is it possible for me, then, not to see my benefactor constantly before me? And how can I possibly waver mentally in my lively faith in Him? Time passes without stopping, and my body, even during my lifetime, 
constantly changes and passes on, and the whole world, as is seen in its motion, also passes on, as though it were hurrying to its appointed end, like a machine set in motion. Where, then, is constancy? Constancy is that which moves and directs all this to its purpose. The first cause of all that is complex and created is constant, being itself not complex, and therefore not passing but eternal. The souls of angels and men, created after the image of the first cause, are also constant. Everything else is like a soap bubble. I do not lower creation by these words, but only thus speak of it in comparison with the Creator and beatified souls. Value by its properties that greatest miracle of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, is manifested in the communion, with faith, of His divine mysteries. What is the miracle? The peace-giving and life-giving effect upon your heart, slain by sin, which is so apparent after the uneasiness of heart and the spiritual deadness that often precedes communion. Never consider it from habit as anything ordinary or unimportant. By such thoughts and such a disposition of heart you will incur the wrath of God, and you will not enjoy peace nor feel renewed life after communion. By the most lively and heartfelt gratitude for the holy life-giving sacrament you will obtain life from the Lord, and your faith will increase more and more. Fear and uneasiness proceed from unbelief. Consider their arising during communion as a true sign, that by unbelief you are removing yourself from the life contained in the cup, and do not pay attention to them. O oh, faith, faith! Thou thyself art a miracle to us. It is thou that savest us. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And after lively faith in God's truth, we always go from God in peace, whilst, on the contrary, after unbelief, always without peace. Ah! Satan often enters into us after we have unworthily communicated of the divine mysteries and in every way tries to instill his lie into our hearts, that is, unbelief, for unbelief is the same thing as a lie. The destroyer of men now, as of old, tries in every way to destroy men by his lying, and by various thoughts and desires, and having stolen into the heart in the form of unbelief, or any passion, he manifests himself in a manner worthy of him, mostly by impatience and malice, and you see that he is in you. But you will not often at once rid yourself of him, because he usually takes care to close every outlet in your heart by unbelief, obduracy, and others of his brood. Thy labor is in vain, thou fallen angel. I am the servant of my Lord Jesus Christ." Thou that exaltest thyself in thine arrogance, lowers thyself by thus violently struggling with me, weak as I am. Say thus mentally to the evil spirit, as he lays his heavy load on your heart, and compels you to evil of various kinds. These words will be like fiery scourges to the proud spirit, and he, shamed by your firmness and spiritual wisdom, will flee from you. You at once will perceive, feel, and wonder at the marvelous change in you. The heavy, soul-destroying load in your heart will no longer be there. You will feel so relieved, and will be convinced by your feelings that there are spirits of evil hovering around us, and constantly seeking our destruction, poisoning our hearts with the poison of dark and evil thoughts, and endeavoring to destroy our love to mankind in fellowship with them. As all my misfortunes arise in my invisible mind and my invisible heart, therefore I require the invisible Saviour, who directs our hearts. O my strength, Jesus, Son of God, 
O light of my mind, the peace, the joy of my heart, glory to thee, glory to thee, deliverer from my invisible enemies, that fight against my mind and my heart, slaying me in the very source of my life, in my most sensitive part. Keep a strict watch against every appearance of pride. It appears imperceptibly, particularly in time of vexation and irritability against others for quite unimportant causes. The miraculous effect of the life-giving cross upon our souls, tortured by the poison of evil, proves to us most undoubtedly and clearly. 1. That we have indeed a soul, a spiritual being. 2. That there are evil spirits, harming our souls. 3. That God exists and our Lord Jesus Christ and that he is always with us through his divinity. And four, that he has indeed accomplished our salvation by his sufferings and death on the cross, and has destroyed the power of the devil by means of the cross. How many proofs of the advantage of our faith there are in the wonderful action upon us of the life-giving cross alone! Glory be to the Christian faith! Men who are leading a spiritual life see by the eyes of their heart how the devil lays his snares, how the angels guide us, and how the Lord, in his sovereign power, allows the temptations, and how he comforts. The only means by which you can spend the day in perfect holiness, peace, and without sin is the most sincere, fervent prayer as soon as you rise from sleep in the morning. It will bring Christ into your heart, with the Father and the Holy Ghost, and will thus strengthen and fortify your soul against any evil. But still it will be necessary for you carefully to guard your heart. Sometimes in the affliction of your soul you wish to die. It is easy to die, and does not take long, but are you prepared for death? Remember that after death the judgment of your whole life will follow. You are not prepared for death, and if it were to come to you, you would shudder all over. Therefore do not waste words in vain. Do not say, It is better for me to die, but say rather, How can I prepare for death in a Christian manner? By means of faith, by means of good works, and by bravely bearing the miseries and sorrows that happen to you, so as to be able to meet death fearlessly, peacefully, and without shame, not as a rigorous law of nature, but as a fatherly call of the eternal, heavenly, holy, and blessed Father unto the everlasting kingdom. Remember the old man who, being weary of his heavy burden, called for death. When it came, he did not wish to die, and preferred to go on carrying his heavy burden. With the mental eyes of my heart, I see how I mentally breathe Christ in my heart, how he enters into it, and suddenly tranquilizes and rejoices it. Oh, do not leave me to dwell alone without thyself, the life-giver, my breath, my joy. It is hard for me to be left without thee. Is it possible to pray rapidly without injuring the effect of the prayer? It is possible to those who have learned to pray inwardly with a pure heart. During prayer it is necessary that your heart should sincerely desire that which you ask for, should feel the truth of what you are saying, and this comes naturally to a pure heart. That is why it is capable of praying even rapidly, and at the same time agreeably, to God, as the rapidity in this case does not injure the truth, sincerity, of the prayer. But for those who have not attained the capability of praying sincerely, it is necessary to pray slowly, waiting for a corresponding echo in the heart to each word of the prayer. 
and this is not always soon given to men unaccustomed to prayerful contemplation. Therefore, for such men, it must be laid down as an absolute rule to pronounce the words of the prayer slowly and with pauses. Wait until every word gives back its corresponding echo in your heart. Sometimes in his heart a man draws near to God. Sometimes he goes far from God, and therefore he experiences either peace and joy, or fear, disturbance, and oppression. The one is life, the other spiritual death. We draw near to God mostly in time of affliction, from which no one can save us but God, to whom we then turn with our whole heart, and thus approach Him sincerely. Whilst we go far from God in times of ease and abundance of earthly blessings, which make the old carnal man proud of himself, and, especially when he thirsts for riches, glory, and distinction, and has obtained all these, he loses faith from his heart and forgets God, his judge and recompenser, forgets the immortality of his soul, and his duty to love God with all his heart and his neighbor as himself. As an ill-natured man, coming with a request to one who is kind, gentle, and meek, for the greater success of his request tries to resemble him, so the Christian, approaching God with a prayer to him, or to his most pure mother, or to the angels and saints, in order to ensure the success of his prayer, ought to try to resemble as far as possible the Lord himself, or his most pure mother, or the angels and saints. In this lies the secret of drawing near to God, and of his speedily hearing our prayers. The Holy Trinity sees and hears me. This is the most life-giving assurance for my heart, penetrating it with peace and joy. The benign Mother of God the Word also sees me, and hears my prayers, and my sighing towards her. And this is another comforting assurance, constantly realized. Thus will I walk, with the feeling of God's omnipresence and omniscience. The most striking proof that there is a devil in the world is that men do not feel, or feel very little, the some endeavor to do so. The mercies that God has bestowed upon them in the creation, guidance, and redemption. The devil is a powerful antagonist to everything good and righteous. The problem of our life is union with God, and sin completely prevents this. Therefore, flee from sin is from a terrible enemy, as from the destroyer of the soul, because to be without God is death and not life. Let us therefore understand our destination. Let us always remember that our common master calls us to union with himself. It is especially necessary for Christians to have a pure heart, so that they may be able to see God with the eyes of the heart, as He is, with His love to us, and with all His perfections, as well as to be able to contemplate the beauty of the angels, all the glory of the Holy Virgin, the beauty of her soul and her greatness as the Mother of God, and the beauty of the souls of God's saints and their love to us, we must see them as they are in themselves. We must contemplate the truths of the Christian faith, with all its sacraments, and feel their greatness. We must see the state of our own souls, and especially our sins. An impure heart, that is, a heart occupied with earthly passions, feeds itself on the carnal desires of the eyes and worldly pride. It cannot see any of the things we have indicated. Prayer is the lifting up of the mind and heart to God. From this it is evident that it is quite impossible for anyone to pray whose mind and heart are attached to anything carnal, for instance, to money or to honors, or who has in his heart passions such as hatred or envy for others because passions usually contract the heart, in the same way as God expands it, 
and gives it true freedom. It is incomprehensible how Jesus Christ is united with the sign of the cross, and gives it the wonderful power of driving away passions, demons, and to calm the troubled soul. It is likewise incomprehensible how the Spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ is united with the bread and wine, transforming them into his own flesh and blood, and manifestly cleansing our souls from sin, bringing into it heavenly peace and tranquillity, and making it good, gentle, humble, and full of hearty faith and hope. This is partly explained by the fact that the Almighty Creating Spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ is everywhere, and that everywhere He calleth those things which be not as though they were, and therefore much more can He make what exists other from what it was. And in order that the unbelieving heart should not think that both the sign of the cross and the name of Christ act miraculously by themselves, apart from and independently of Christ himself. This same cross and name of Christ do not perform any miracles until I see Jesus Christ with the eyes of my heart, or by faith, and until I believe with my whole heart all that which he has accomplished for our salvation. End of section 2 Section 3 of My Life in Christ by St. John of Kronstadt Translated by E. E. Gulioff This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I am with you alway, even unto the end of the world. So it is, Master. Thou art with us throughout all days. We are not a single day without Thee and we cannot live without thy presence near us. Thou art with us especially in the sacrament of thy body and blood. Oh, how truly and essentially art thou present in the holy mysteries! Thou, our Lord, in every liturgy, takest upon thyself a vile body similar to ours in every respect save that of sin and feedest us with thy life-giving flesh. Through the sacrament thou art holy with us, and thy flesh is united to our flesh, whilst thy spirit is united to our soul. And we feel this life-giving, most peaceful, most sweet union. We feel that by joining ourselves to thee in the Holy Eucharist, we become one spirit with thee, as it is said. He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. We become like thee, good, meek, and lowly, as thou hast said of thyself, I am meek and lowly in heart. True it is that often our evil and blind flesh, or the prince of this world, who dwells in our simple flesh, whispers to us that the sacrament contains only bread and wine, and not the very body and blood of our Lord himself, and sends sight, taste, and feeling as his crafty witnesses to this. But we do not allow ourselves to listen to these calumnies, and reason thus. To thee, Lord, everything is possible. Thou createst the flesh of men, animals, fishes, birds, reptiles, of all creatures. Is it possible that for thyself, thou, who art everywhere and fillest everything, wilt not create flesh? Not only this, thou changest a dead substance into a living one, as, for instance, Moses' rod into the serpent, and there is nothing impossible for thee. Canst thou not, therefore, create flesh for thyself out of bread and wine, which are so near to our flesh, being used for our food and drink, and thus being converted into our own flesh and blood? Thou dost not test our faith more than it can bear. 
for thou dost not transubstantiate a lump of earth into thy most pure body, but white bread, soft, clean, pleasant to the taste, and thou dost not create thy blood from water, but from wine, called in holy scripture the blood of the grape, corresponding in color to that of blood, agreeable to the taste, and rejoicing the heart of man. Thou knowest our infirmity, the weakness of our faith, and therefore thou condescendest to employ in the sacrament of thy body and blood the substances most suitable to them. Let us, therefore, firmly believe that under the form of bread and wine we communicate of the true body and of the true blood of our Lord, that in the mystery of the Holy Communion Jesus Christ himself will dwell with us alway, even unto the end of the world. Our soul is, so to say, a reflection of God's countenance, and the brighter this reflection is, the clearer and calmer is the soul, and the less bright this reflection is, the darker, the more disturbed is the soul. And as our soul is our heart, it is necessary that every truth of God should be reflected in it through feeling, through gratitude, and that there should be no reflection in it of any lie. Feel God's love in the most pure mysteries, feel the truth of all prayers. Our heart is a mirror, as the objects of the outer world are reflected in an ordinary mirror so ought the truth to be reflected with all exactitude in our hearts. It is good, very good indeed, to be virtuous. The virtuous man is at peace himself, is pleasing to God and agreeable to other people. The virtuous man involuntarily attracts everyone's attention. Why is it so? because fragrance involuntarily attracts attention and makes everyone wish to breathe it. Look upon the very appearance of the virtuous man, upon his countenance. What sort of a countenance is it? It is the face of an angel. Meekness and humility overspread it, and involuntarily captivate everyone by their beauty. Pay attention to his speech. From it there comes still greater fragrance. Here you are as if face to face with his soul, and are enraptured with his sweet converse. Love calms and agreeably expands the heart, whilst hatred painfully contracts and disturbs it. Those who hate others torture and tyrannize over themselves, therefore they are the most foolish of the foolish ones. When you see your body wasted through sickness, do not murmur against God, but say, The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You are accustomed to look upon your body as upon your own inalienable property, but that is quite wrong, because your body is God's edifice. What a great personage a priest is! He is in constant converse with God, and God constantly replies to his speech, as whatever the ceremonies of the church may be, whatever his prayers, he is speaking to God, and whatever the ceremonies of the church may be, and whatever his prayers, the Lord answers him. How, under these circumstances, when assaulted by passions, can the priest forget that such passions are base, impure, especially for him, and that it is impossible to let them enter into his heart, which Jesus Christ alone ought to fill entirely? A priest is an angel and not a man. Everything worldly ought to be left far away behind him. O Lord, let thy priests be clothed with righteousness. Let them always remember the greatness of their calling, and do not let them be entangled in the nets of the world and the devil. Let them be saved from the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, 
and the lust of other things entering into their hearts. There are innumerable and various ways by means of which the devil enters into our soul and removes it from God, pressing upon it with all his being, dark, hateful, and destroying. Whatever the motion of passion may be, he finds a way and does not neglect the least opportunity of entering the soul. Likewise, there are innumerable and various ways for the Holy Ghost to enter it, the way of sincere faith, of true humility, of love to God and to our neighbor, and so on. But, to our misfortune, the destroyer of men from time immemorial makes every effort to obstruct, by all possible means, all these ways for the Holy Ghost to enter the soul. The most usual way to God for us sinners, who have strayed from Him into a faraway land, is the way of painful suffering and bitter tears. Both the Holy Scriptures and actual experience testify that, in order to draw near to God, it is necessary for the sinner to suffer, weep, shed tears, and to amend his deceitful heart. Draw nigh to God, be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Tears have power to cleanse the wickedness of our heart, and sufferings and affliction are necessary, because through suffering the sinful expansion of the heart is salutarily contracted, and when the heart is thus contracted, tears more easily flow. When the devil is in our heart, then we feel an unusual overwhelming load and fire in the breast and in the heart. The soul contracts extremely and darkens. Everything irritates it. It feels an aversion to every good work. The words and acts of other persons in reference to ourselves we interpret falsely, and see in them ill will and designs against our honor and therefore we feel a deep, deadly hatred towards them. We are infuriated and long for vengeance. By their fruits ye shall know them. There are days when the spirit of evil disturbs me. Men have fallen into unbelief because they have either completely lost the spirit of prayer or never had it at all, nor have it now. In short, because they do not pray. The prince of this world has full scope for action in the hearts of such men. He becomes their master. They have not asked and do not ask God's grace in prayer. For God's gifts are only given to those who ask and seek. And thus their hearts, corrupt by nature, become dried up without the vivifying dew of the Holy Ghost and at last from their extreme dryness they take fire and blaze with the infernal flame of unbelief and various passions and the devil only knows how to inflame the passions to keep up this terrible fire and triumphs at the sight of the ruin of the unfortunate souls that were redeemed by the blood of him who has trampled the power of satan under foot a MORNING PRAYER O God, Creator and Master of the world, mercifully protect Thy creature, adorned with Thy godly image, in these morning hours. Let Thine eyes, millions and millions of times brighter than the rays of the sun, vivify and enlighten my soul, darkened and slain by sin. Deliver me from despondency and slothfulness, Grant me joy and vigor of soul, so that with a glad heart I may praise thy mercy, thy holiness, thy boundless greatness, in thine infinite perfections, at every hour and in every place. For thou, Lord, art my creator and the master of my life, and to thee thy reasonable creatures every hour ascribe glory and praise, both now and for ever and to ages of ages. Amen. From the time when man, by his own will, fell away from God, he, like an animal that was once domestic, 
but afterwards grew wild in a thick forest, reluctantly looks back upon the place of his former abode, preferring the darkness of the forest, that is, of this world, to the light of the former place, that is, of God's paradise. It is difficult for him to unite himself to God, and when so united, he often falls away again from him. It is difficult for him to sincerely believe in God, and in all that he has opened to him, and he does not constantly strive to preserve in his heart the heavenly gift of faith. If God does not leave a blade of grass, a flower, or a small leaf of a tree without his good providence, will he leave us? Oh, let every man be convinced with his whole heart that God is true to himself in his providence for even the least of his creatures. Let him understand that the Creator invisibly dwells in all his creatures. In the words of our Saviour, God clothes the grass of the field, feeds the fowls of the air. In how many ways does not God rejoice us, his creatures, even by flowers? Like a tender mother, in his eternal power and wisdom, he every summer creates for us, out of nothing, these most beautiful plants. Let us enjoy them, not forgetting to glorify the goodness of the Creator, our Heavenly Father. Let us on our part, too, reply to His love by loving hearts. He that does not believe in the God who saves us in difficult circumstances, but is faint-hearted, he that does not wish to render glory to God, that represents him as not vigilant but sleeping, not all-powerful and not merciful, thinks falsely of the God of truth, and thus sins grievously. Especially inexcusable are faint-heartedness and unbelief in the man who has already been deemed worthy of often receiving marvellous help from God the Saviour. Oh, how great a sinner I am! The invisible, all-pervading God often insensibly touches my invisible soul, which, from this touch, enjoys wonderful rest and heavenly joy. It is not the eyes which give me tidings of my God. Ordinary feelings are destined for the lower objects of creation. Not the hearing by means of words or sounds of the voice that carries to me the message of the incomprehensible, but the soul itself becomes, so to say, dissolved in God. When you are disturbed and depressed by the wickedness of men, remember how boundlessly you are beloved by the Almighty and all-righteous God, who suffers the evil until the time comes, and then will justly punish it. You cannot master yourself, your tongue, or one single member of your body. Judge by this what he must be, who governs the whole world who keeps it in such wonderful order, who governs the whole of mankind, evil, perverted as we are, ever ready as we are to destroy each other, and yet meanwhile more prosperous than needy under his sovereignty. How almighty and wise must he be to govern such heterogeneous multitudes! Trust in him entirely. When the matter relates to God's mysteries, do not inwardly ask, How can this be? You do not know how God created the whole world from nothing. You cannot and may not know here either how God mysteriously works. God's mystery must remain a mystery for you, because you are not God and cannot know all that is known to the eternally wise, almighty God. You are the work of His hands, His most insignificant creature. Remember that there was a time when there was nothing, and that afterwards all that now exists was created out of nothing by the word of God. Without Him was not anything made that was made. 
You who pray, give God your heart, that loving true heart, with which you love your children, your father and mother, your benefactors and friends, and in which you feel the sweetness of pure, unfeigned love. Sometimes during a long-continued prayer only a few minutes are really pleasing to God and constitute true prayer and true service to God. The chief thing in prayer is the nearness of the heart to God, as proved by the sweetness of God's presence in the soul. Let it be as I will, and not as thou wilt. Such is the mighty voice of God, which our soul ever hears when it has fallen into sin, and desires to emerge from a state of spiritual sinful affliction. Let it be as I will, either repent from the depths of your heart in proportion to the sin, and return to the road that leads to life, shown by me. Either bear the punishment, corresponding to the sin, and determined by my justice, or your sin will torment you as a deviation from my laws. And only then will our soul enjoy peace, when we truly repent from the depths of our heart, in proportion to the sin, or bear the punishment due from God. O Almighty and most just power of our God, invisibly governing our invisible souls, all glory to Thee, glory to Thee, God our Saviour, Thy will be done in us. How easily and speedily the Lord can save us, instantaneously, unexpectedly, imperceptibly, Often during the day I have been a great sinner, and at night, after prayer, I have gone to rest, justified and whiter than snow, by the grace of the Holy Ghost, with the deepest peace and joy in my heart. How easy it will be for the Lord to save us, too, in the evening of our life, at the decline of our days. O oh, save, save, save me, most gracious Lord! Receive me in thy heavenly kingdom. Everything is possible to thee. To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yes, he shall be holden up, for the Lord is able to make him stand. That which is especially important and constitutes the life of the being, the Creator has placed and concealed far away in the very depths within that being. We see this everywhere. Thus in the man the soul is in the very midst of his being, in the heart, and therefore the soul is often called the heart, and the heart the soul. Therefore is my spirit overwhelmed within me, my heart within me is desolate. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Our God is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He is not a God of torments and punishments. Our torments are the fruit of our sins and the work of the incorporeal fallen spirits. Therefore, if you suffer grievously, only blame your sins and the devil, but chiefly yourself, because the devil would not do you any harm if he did not find anything in you that he could fasten on to. I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. My glory will I not give to another. These words of the God of glory are fulfilled every time when in my heart I ascribe the glory of my God's works, accomplished in me by the holy gifts, to anything or anybody else, and do not ascribe them with my whole heart to him. He instantly becomes jealous of the glory of his righteous, ever-miraculous, vivifying mysteries, and in his justice punishes my soul with his fatherly rod. O oh, then my soul clearly hears the voice of its God. My glory will I not give to another. As you do not ascribe to me the glory due to me, so evident to you in my mysteries, I strike you inwardly with the rod of my truth, so that you may thus know and heartily believe 
that I never will give my glory to another. I cleanse your sins and make your soul whiter than snow by my blood. I visit your soul with peace and joy. I warm and cherish you as a mother cherishes her child, and I instill within you my meekness and humility. I pour love into your heart. I completely transform and change you, to your own wonder, into a new man. And to whom else shall I give the glory of my works? I am eternally unchangeable. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the Son of Man that he should repent. The invisible God acts upon my soul as if he were visible as if he were present here before me, knowing all my thoughts and feelings, every inward slothfulness, stubbornness, or other passion is always accompanied by a corresponding punishment. In general, if my inward disposition is unworthy of God, of his holiness, then I suffer punishment for it in my heart, a devouring fire. And if it is a worthy one, then I am joyful and at peace. No, whatever you may say, a man is sometimes too irritable and too evil to be so of himself, but he becomes so through the most zealous endeavors of the devil. Only watch yourselves or others at the time of irritation and wickedness, when you yourself or anyone else would wish to destroy the person who is inimical to you, really or in your imagination compare this state with that which follows it sometimes soon afterwards by the action of your guardian angel tranquillity meekness and kindness either in yourself or in any one whom you watch with the former opposite condition and you will say to yourself no this seems quite a different man from him who not long ago was so full of evil and rage. This man is the one out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, meek and humble, clothed and in his right mind. In him there is not even a shadow of the former wickedness and the former foolishness. Some deny the existence of evil spirits, but such phenomena in the human life clearly prove their existence. If every phenomenon has its corresponding reason, and if the tree is to be judged by its fruits, then who will not see in the madly infuriated man the presence of the evil spirit, who cannot show himself otherwise than in a manner worthy of him? Who will not see the chief of all evil in the outpouring of anger? Besides this, a man subjected to irritability and breathing malice, clearly feels the presence of a hostile evil power in his breast. It produces in the soul quite the reverse of that which has been said by the Saviour of his own presence. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. By the presence of the former spirit, one feels ill at ease and oppressed, both in body and soul. You hear in church, oftener than anything, the voices of the priests, deacons, readers, and singers, praying God to have mercy upon us. What does this signify? It signifies that all of us who are in God's temple are deserving, by our sins, of God's punishment, and that before everything, on our coming into the church, we must remember that we are sinners, and have come to the Lord of heaven and earth, to our Creator and Benefactor, whom we have daily and hourly angered by our iniquities, to ask for mercy, each one for himself, and also, in accordance with Christian love, for others. The prayers asking for mercy are called in the Russian Orthodox Church great, small, and redoubled. As there is not a single superfluous word in the church service, it is especially necessary at the time of the singing of the redoubled litany to pray to God most fervently, from the very depths of a most contrite heart, 
as we are reminded at the very beginning of the litany by the words, Let us say with our whole souls and with our whole understanding. At this time we must lay aside even the slightest coldness, the slightest inattention of heart, and burning with the spirit of humility, becoming all attention, offer up to the Creator our most fervent prayers, to have mercy upon us sinners. But what do we see at the time of the exclamations of the priest and the singing by the singers of the great and redoubled litany? For the greater part, the usual inattention and indifference on the part of those praying. As after having unworthily communicated, so also after having prayed unworthily and coldly, our soul feels equally ill at ease. This means that God does not enter our heart, being offended at its unbelief and coldness, and allows the evil spirit to nestle in our hearts, in order to make us feel the difference between his own presence and its yoke. A Terrible Truth Impenitent sinners, after their death, lose every possibility of changing for good, and therefore remain unalterably given up to everlasting torments, for sin cannot but torment. How is this proved? It is plainly proved by the actual state of some sinners, and by the nature of sin itself, to keep the man its prisoner, and to close every outlet to him. Who does not know how difficult it is, without God's special grace, for a sinner to turn away from the way of sin that is so dear to him into the path of virtue? How deeply sin takes root in the heart of the sinner, and in all his being! How it gives the sinner its own way of looking at things, by means of which he sees them quite differently to what they are in reality! and shows him everything in a kind of alluring light. It is for this reason that we see that sinners very often do not even think of their conversion, and do not consider themselves to be great sinners, because their eyes are blinded by their self-love and pride. And if they do consider themselves sinners, then they give themselves up to the most terrible despair, which overwhelms their mind with thick darkness and greatly hardens their heart. But for the grace of God, what sinner would have returned to God? For it is the nature of sin to darken our souls, to bind us hand and foot. But the time and place for the action of grace is here alone. After death there remain only the prayers of the church, and these prayers can be efficacious for penitent sinners only. That is, only for those who have developed in their souls the capability of receiving God's mercy, or of benefiting by the prayers of the church, that is, the light of the good works which they have taken with them out of this life. Impenitent sinners are undoubtedly sons of perdition, what does my experience tell me when I am the prisoner of sin? I am tormented sometimes the whole day, and cannot turn to God with my whole heart, because sin hardens my heart, making God's mercy inaccessible to me. I burn in the fire, and willingly remain in it, because sin has bound my powers, and I, like one inwardly chained, am unable to turn to God until He, seeing my helplessness, my humility, and my tears, takes pity on me and bestows His grace upon me. It is not without reason that a man given over to sin is spoken of as delivered into chains of darkness. Your spiritual life is clearly divided into two states, differing acutely one from the other into a state of peace, joy, expansion of heart, and into a state of suffering, fear, and contraction of heart. The causes of the first state are the actions of your soul when in conformity with the Creator's laws, and the cause of the second state, the transgression of His holy laws. I always can and do notice the beginning of one or the other state, 
I have the consciousness of the one and the other state. Therefore it always happens that by doing away with the reasons from which the state of suffering and contraction of heart have proceeded, the consequences, that is, the suffering and contraction of the soul, are also done away with. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? Truly Christ dwells in me. Meanwhile, I have until now been a reprobate. I did not think, and was not firmly convinced, that the Lord is in me. It is He, the All-Holy, that is so sensitive in me to the slightest impurity of heart. It is He who incites me to drive away from my soul the very germ of sin in the heart. But alas, Satan is also there, ready to devour me at every step, and contest me from God. When you are struck by other people's suffering and the contraction of their souls, so that you are induced to pray for them with a pitying and contrite heart, pray to God to have mercy upon them and to forgive them their sins, as you would pray for the forgiveness of your own sins, that is, implore God with tears to pardon them. Likewise, pray for the salvation of others, as you would pray for your own salvation. If you attain to this and make it a habit, you will receive from God an abundance of spiritual gifts, the gifts of the Holy Ghost, who loves the soul that cares for the salvation of others, because He Himself, the Most Holy Spirit, wishes to save us all in every possible way, if only we do not oppose Him, and do not harden our hearts. The Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. We often hear from others, or sometimes read in the works of others, what God has placed in our mind and heart, what we ourselves have cherished, that is, we often meet our favorite thoughts in others, and it seems to us as though they had been taken away from us, as though they had been new ones and formed our own exclusive property. Presumptuous thoughts. What? Is there not only one God, the Lord of all intellects? Is not His Spirit in all who seek for truth? Have we not one soul enlightener, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world? Glory to the one God, glory to him who loves all, and bountifully bestows upon all his spiritual and bodily gifts. Glory to him who is no respecter of persons, and who reveals the mysteries of his love, omnipotence, and wisdom unto babes. God's saints are near to believing hearts, and, like the truest and kindest of friends, are ready in a moment to help the faithful and pious who call upon them with faith and love. We have, for the most part, to send and have, sometimes, to wait long for earthly helpers, whilst we have not to send for, nor wait long, for spiritual helpers. The faith of him who prays can place them close to his very heart in a moment and he will as speedily receive through faith full spiritual help. In saying this, I speak by experience. By this I mean the frequent deliverance from affliction of heart through the intercession and patronage of the saints, and especially through the intercession of Our Lady, the Holy Virgin Mary. Probably some would say that this is the action of simple and firm faith, and a determined assurance in our deliverance from affliction, and not the intercession of the saints for us before God. No, it is not so. How can this be proved? It can be proved by the fact that if I do not call upon the saints known to me in hearty prayer, without making any distinction, if I do not see them with my spiritual vision, then I shall obtain no help, however great assurance I may have felt of being saved without their help. I recognize, 
I feel clearly that I receive help through the names of those saints upon whom I have called because of my lively faith in them. This happens just as everything happens in the usual order of earthly things. First, I see my helpers by means of earnest faith. Then, seeing them, I pray to them also with my whole heart, invisibly but intelligibly to myself. After this, having received invisible help in quite an imperceptible manner, but sensibly to my soul, I simultaneously receive a strong conviction that this help has been obtained from them, just as a sick man cured by a doctor is convinced that he has been cured precisely by that doctor and not by any one else, that his illness has passed away not by itself, but through the help of this particular doctor. All this comes to pass so simply that it is only necessary to have eyes in order to see. End of section 3《Section 4 of My Life in Christ》by St. John of Kronstadt, translated by E. E. Gulioff. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I am a man, and the grace, the truth, and the righteousness of God are continually working within me. It is God who at one time cherishes and comforts me, and at another punishes and afflicts me with sorrows for any inward motion of the soul adverse to him. But the earth is full of men like me. Therefore in them also God manifests his mercy, truth, and righteousness, as in myself. He worketh all in all. Let no one think that sin is something unimportant. No, sin is a terrible evil that destroys the soul, both now and in the future life. The sinner in the future life will be bound hand and foot, meaning the soul, and cast into outer darkness. As the Saviour said, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into outer darkness. That is, he entirely loses the freedom of his spiritual powers, which, being created for free activity, suffer through this a kind of overwhelming inactivity for every good work. In his soul the sinner recognizes his powers, and at the same time he feels that these powers are bound by unbreakable chains. He shall be holden with the cords of his sin. To this must be added the terrible torment arising from the very sins themselves, from the consciousness of our own foolishness during the earthly life, and from the image of the angry Creator. Even in this present life sin binds and destroys the soul. What God-fearing man does not know what sorrow and oppression strike his soul, what torturing, burning fire rages in his breast when he has sinned but besides binding and destroying the soul as it does temporarily sin also destroys it eternally if we do not repent here of our sins and our iniquities from our whole heart here is also a proof by experience that sin destroys the soul temporarily and eternally if it happens to any God-fearing person to go to sleep without having repented of the sin, or the sins he has committed during the day, and which have tormented his soul, these torments will accompany him the whole night, until he has heartily repented of his sin, and washed his heart with tears. This is also from experience. The torments of sin will wake him up from sweet sleep, because his soul will be oppressed, bound a prisoner by sin. Now, suppose that the man who has gone to sleep in any sin, and is tormented by it, is overtaken during the night by death. Is it not clear that his soul will go into the other life in torment, 
and that as after death there is no place for repentance, he will be tormented there according to the measure of his sins? The Holy Scriptures also testify to this. Watch yourselves, your passions especially, in your home life, where they appear freely like moles in a safe place. Outside our own home, some of our passions are usually screened by other more decorous passions, whilst at home there is no possibility of driving away these black moles that undermine the integrity of our soul. For the soul of the pious, God-fearing man, there is an invisible spiritual intercourse with God. Like a father or a stern teacher, the Lord at one time approves, at another condemns our thoughts, desires, and intentions. At one time he says that this is good and that bad. He rewards us for the good and punishes us for the evil. And all this is at once evident to the soul. Begin to fulfill the commandments relating to small things, and you will come to fulfill the commandments relating to great things. Small things everywhere lead to great ones. Begin by fulfilling the commandment of fasting on Wednesdays and Fridays, or the tenth commandment relating to evil thoughts and desires, and you will eventually learn to fulfill all the commandments. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. A man that only dreams of this perishable life and does not think of the eternal, heavenly life. Consider, what is your transitory life? It is a constant laying in of fuel, meaning food, in order that the fire of our life may continue to burn and should not grow feeble, in order that our house, meaning the body, should keep warm, and that the continually changing life of our body should be restored by means of the nourishing parts of the organs of other living creatures, who are deprived of life in order to keep up the life of our body. Indeed, what an insignificant cobweb your life is, man! You are obliged twice daily to strengthen the interior of your body by means of supports to keep it sound. That is, you are obliged to fortify yourself twice every day by food and drink. And every night daily you must lock up your soul in your body, shutting up all the sensations of the body, like the shutters of a house, in order that the soul may not live outside the body but within it, giving it warmth and life. What a cobweb your life is, and how easy it is to tear it asunder. Be humble and reverent before the life eternal. Truth is the foundation of everything that has been created. Let truth be also the foundation of all your works, both inward and outward, and especially the foundation of your prayers. Let all your life, all your works, all your thoughts, and all your desires be founded upon truth. Take the trouble to spend only one single day according to God's commandments, and you will see yourself, you will feel by your own heart, how good it is to fulfill God's will. And God's will in relation to us is our life, our eternal blessedness. Love God with all your heart, at least as much as you love your father, your mother, and your benefactors. Value with all your strength his love and his benefits to you. Go over them mentally in your heart. Think how he gave you existence and with it all good things. How endlessly long he bears with your sins. How endlessly he forgives you them. For the sake of your hearty repentance, by virtue of the suffering and death upon the cross of his only begotten Son, what blessedness he has promised you in eternity, if you are faithful to him. Enumerate besides his mercies, which are endlessly great and manifold. Furthermore, love every man as yourself, that is, do not wish him anything that you would not wish for yourself. 
think, feel for him just as you would think and feel for your own self. Do not wish to see in him anything that you do not wish to see in yourself. Do not let your memory keep in it any evil caused to you by others, in the same way as you would wish that the evil done by yourself should be forgotten by others. Do not intentionally imagine either in yourself or in another anything guilty or impure. Believe others to be as well-intentioned as yourself, in general, if you do not see clearly that they are evilly disposed. Do unto them as you would to yourself, or even do not do unto them as you would not do unto yourself and then you will see what you will obtain in your heart, what peace, what blessedness. You will be in paradise before reaching it, that is, before the paradise in heaven, you will be in the paradise on earth. The kingdom of God is within you, says the Lord. He that dwelleth in love, teaches the apostle, dwelleth in God, and God in him. Worship God in spirit and in truth. In truth, for instance, when you say, Hallowed be thy name. Do you really desire that God's name should be hallowed by the good works of others and by your own? When you say, Thy kingdom come, do you indeed desire the coming of God's kingdom? Do you wish to be the abode of the Spirit of God and not the abode of sin? Would you not more willingly live in sin? When you say, Thy will be done, do you not rather seek your own will than that of God? A. It is so. When you say, Give us this day our daily bread, do you not say otherwise in your heart, I do not need to ask this of thee, I have enough without asking, let the poor ask for this. Or else, do we not greedily seek for more, and are not satisfied with the little, or with that which God has given us? We do not thank God for what we have as we ought to. In the prayer, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us, do you not think in yourself, God knows that I am not such a great sinner, it seems to me that I do not live any worse than others, and there is no need for me to ask that my trespasses or sins should be forgiven. Or else, when you thus pray, is there not any displeasure or anger in your heart against any one? For if so, you lie shamelessly to God in your prayer. You say, And lead us not into temptation. But do you not yourself rush impetuously into every sin without even being tempted? You say, Deliver us from evil. But do you not live in friendship with the devil, or with evil of every kind, of which the devil is chief? Beware, then, that your tongue is not in discordance with your heart. See that you do not lie to God in your prayer. Always keep this in view when you say the Lord's Prayer, as well as when you say other prayers. Watch whether your heart agrees with everything that your tongue pronounces. The purer the heart is, the larger it is, and the more able it is to find room within it for a greater number of beloved ones, whilst the more sinful it is, the more contracted it becomes and the less number of beloved can it find room for, because it is limited by self-love, and that love is a false one. We love ourselves in objects unworthy of the immortal soul, in silver and gold, in adultery, in drunkenness, and such like. If God communicates an invincible, incomprehensible divine power to the life-giving cross, then why should it be wonderful that he communicates a similar incomprehensible power in order to regenerate our nature to the most pure, terrible and life-giving sacrament of his body and blood? Oh, how great art thou, Lord, 
and how wonderful are thy works, how endless is thy omnipotence. Whatever is touched by thy power and thy grace becomes life-giving. If you wish to correct any one from his faults, do not think of correcting him solely by your own means. You would only do harm by your own passions, for instance, by pride and by the irritability arising from it. But cast thy burden upon the Lord, and pray to God, who trieth the hearts and reins, with all your heart, that he himself may enlighten the mind and heart of that man. If he sees that your prayer breathes love, and that it really comes from the depth of your heart, he will infallibly fulfill the desire of your heart, and you yourself will soon tell, seeing the change that has taken place in him for whom you have prayed, that it is the work of the right hand of God the Most High. Who is it that so wisely, delicately, and beautifully arranges and transforms the ugly, that is, the sightless, formless substance of the earth into flowers? Who gives them their wonderful forms? Creator, grant that we may salute in the flowers thy wisdom, thy goodness, thine omnipotence. Our inward disposition even when unexpressed by outward signs, strongly affects the inward disposition of others. This very often happens, though it is not every one that notices it. Supposing that I am angry, or that I have unkind thoughts of another, he feels it, and begins likewise to have unkind thoughts about me. There is a certain communication between our souls, besides our bodily senses. As regards the action of our soul upon others through the senses, it would seem that one soul can act wonderfully upon another man through the sense of sight, even when he is at a distance from us, but as long as he is accessible to our sight, and is alone at the time when we direct our gaze upon him. Thus by the eye we can place another man in an awkward position, and confuse him. It has happened to me more than once to look fixedly out of the window of my house at the people passing by, and they, as if drawn by some power to the very window from which I was looking, looked round at the window, seeking to find a human face in it, whilst others became confused, suddenly quickened their pace, and set themselves to rights, readjusting their neckerchiefs, hats, etc., there is some kind of mystery in this. Observe the difference between the presence of the life-giving spirit and the presence of the spirit that deadens and destroys your soul. When there are good thoughts in your soul, you feel happy and at ease. When peace and joy are in your heart, then the spirit of good, the Holy Ghost, is within you whilst when evil thoughts or evil motions of the heart arise within you, you feel ill at ease and oppressed. When you are inwardly troubled, then the spirit of evil, the crafty spirit, is within you. When the spirit of evil is in us, then, together with oppression of heart and disturbance, we generally feel the difficulty in drawing near to God in our heart, because the evil spirit binds our soul, and will not let it raise itself to God. The evil spirit is a spirit of doubt, unbelief, of passions, oppression, grief, and disturbance, whilst the spirit of good is one of undoubting faith, of virtue, of spiritual freedom and breadth, a spirit of peace and joy. Know by these tokens when the spirit of God is within you, and when the spirit of evil, and, as often as possible, raise your grateful heart to the most holy spirit that gives you life and light, and flee with all your power from doubt, unbelief, and the passions through which the evil serpent, the thief and the destroyer of our souls, creeps in. Sometimes in the lives of pious Christians, there are hours when God seems to have entirely abandoned them, 
hours of the power of darkness, and then the man from the depths of his heart cries unto God, Why hast thou turned thy face from me, thou everlasting light? For a strange darkness has covered me, the darkness of the accursed evil Satan, and has obscured all my soul. It is very grievous for the soul to be in his torturing darkness, which gives a presentiment of the torments and darkness of hell. Turn me, O Saviour, to the light of thy commandments, and make straight my spiritual way, I fervently pray thee. If you do not yourself experience the action of the wiles of the evil spirit, you will not know, and will not appreciate in value as you ought, the benefits bestowed upon you by the Holy Spirit. Not knowing the spirit that destroys, you will not know the spirit that gives life. Only by means of direct contrast of good and evil, of life and death, can we clearly know the one and the other. If you are not subjected to distresses and dangers of bodily or spiritual death, you will not truly know the Saviour, the life-giver, who delivers us from these distresses and from spiritual death. Jesus Christ is the consolation, the joy, the life, the peace and the breath of our hearts. Glory to God, the most wise and most gracious, that He allows the spirit of evil and death to tempt and torment us. Otherwise, we should not have sufficiently appreciated and valued the comfort of grace, the comfort of the Holy Ghost, the Comforter, the life-giving. The Lord God, as life itself, and the superabundance of life, everlastingly the same, as has been said by St. Gregory the theologian, moves and remains in the three persons, that is, God is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. You ask how there can be three persons in God. I answer, I do not understand how, but I know that it must be so, it cannot be otherwise. You further ask, why is the third person in God called the Spirit, and why is he a separate person when without this God is a Spirit? I answer, God's Spirit is called Spirit in relation to His creatures. God breathed through the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Ghost, and there appeared at His call an innumerable multitude of spirits, all the host of them by the breathing of His mouth. He breathed through His Spirit into the human structure, and man became a living soul. And from this breath men were born and will yet be born until the end of the world, according to the commandment, Be fruitful and multiply. If by His Holy Spirit God has created such separate individual creatures, then how can the Holy Ghost be other than a separate person or an individual creating being Himself? The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. You see that the Holy Ghost is called the Spirit as one of the persons of the Holy Trinity. If there are innumerable multitudes of created individual spirits, then why should God himself remain without a spirit, as without one of the persons of the Trinity, separate and independent? Is not the Son the wisdom of the Father, personal and living, indispensable to God? Look upon yourself. You are a creature, and even in you there is such wisdom that many wonder at it. Sometimes you even create wonderful things, and you are extolled as the creator of these things. And yet this is only you, an insignificant, infirm creature then consider how can there not be a personal wisdom in God? How can God be a creator without his own living independent wisdom? Look upon everything in the world, how wise everything is, 
how in the smallest things you may notice the amazing wisdom and the wonderful work of the all-wise thought with its marvellous accuracy and irreproachable neatness how can god be without a personal wisdom consider how can god who has created a multitude of reasonable individual wise living creatures not engender for himself a personal wisdom is it possible is it reasonable is it in accordance with all the other perfections of the creator thus in god there must be a personal wisdom or the personal word of the father as well as the life-giving holy ghost who proceedeth from the father and who resteth in the son in you there is breath material and impersonal while in god as the life itself there is a personal spirit not diffusible but single and giving life to everything the unnatural mastery of the flesh over the spirit is expressed amongst other things by the fact that the spirit is as though buried within the flesh and is bound by it this is especially visible when the matter relates to god's service then the man mostly draws near to god with his lips only that is with his flesh falsely and not with his heart not with his spirit and thus does not worship him truly indeed we often so live as though we had no spirit in us and the highest degree of human depravity is manifested by the fact that the spirit is completely stifled and the man becomes as though he were flesh alone my spirit shall not always strive with man for that he also is flesh look more closely into the matter of men's reverence for god and you will see how in this respect the flesh endeavours to dominate over the spirit in the saints we see the dominance of the spirit over the flesh because they live by the spirit and see the spirit throughout the whole world the wisdom the omnipotence and goodness of god they see in every phenomenon in every work the impress of the spirit in sensual men the dominance of the flesh over the spirit is shown by their only seeing that which represents itself to their senses in fact as the saying is they do not see beyond their nose the carnal sensual man looks at the world and sees it like an unreasoning animal he does not marvel at the wisdom the everlasting power and the goodness of the creator as shown in it when he reads a holy book he sees in it only the letters when he prays he says the prayers mechanically without penetrating into their spirit he does not know the art of worshipping in spirit and in truth the flesh predominates also in men's education look are pupils in the schools taught that which concerns the christian more than anything prayer are they taught to see god the flesh will prevail in the world until the end of ages when the son of man cometh shall he find faith on the earth and unbelief is the work of the flesh as it was in the beginning of the world it is pleasing to god when a man begins to notice his action in the heart because he is the light and the truth whilst the devil especially fears this being himself darkness and falsehood and the darkness cannot come to the light for fear its doings shall be revealed the devil is powerful only through darkness deceit and falsehood reveal his falsehood place it before the light and all will disappear he induces men into every passion through deceit and thus he lulls them to sleep and prevents their seeing things in their true light the devil's covering lies over many things why does not the sinful soul obtain remission of its sins before it feels all their foolishness all their destructiveness and all their falsity from the whole heart because the heart is our soul as it committed the sins 
finding them at the time pleasant and plausible, therefore it now must repent of them and recognize them as leading to destruction and entirely wrong. This repentance is accomplished painfully in the heart, as the desire to sin is also usually in the heart. Do not be disturbed when malice rages within you and strives to discharge itself in words of bitterness, but command it to be silent and to die within you. Otherwise, being accustomed to see your obedience and to flow from your lips, it will master you. As water standing behind an earth dam, in finding an aperture, washes it wider and wider and filters through it, if we do not strengthen the dam, or strengthen it insufficiently, at last, with growing weakness on our part, and with repeated efforts, the water gets through with greater and greater force, so that at last it becomes very difficult, and even impossible to stop it. So also with malice hidden in the heart of men. If we let it pierce through once, twice, and thrice, it will pour out more and more powerfully, and may at last break through and overflow your dam. Learn that in the soul there are waters of evil, as has been said by the psalmist. The waters are come in unto my soul. When you have sinned against God, and your sins torment, burn you, then seek quickly the only sacrifice for sins, eternal and living, and lay your sins before the face of that sacrifice. Do not think you can obtain salvation by your own means. The Lord might have made the whole world, heaven and earth, into his own body. Or instead of creating the world, he might have created for himself a temple for his body. And it is only on your account that he deigned to create to himself a body similar to your own, in order to save you, and having created the world from nothing, he has also created out of a small part of it his body to give life to you, leaving the world to remain as he created it. O goodness and mercy of God! We are members of his body through the communion of his life-giving mysteries. The world, as the work of the living, most wise God, is full of life. There are life and wisdom in everything, and we find everywhere the expression of thought in the whole, as also in every separate part. This is the true book, from which, though not so clearly as from Revelation, we may learn the knowledge of God. Before the world was, there was only the living, infinite God. When the world was called into being from its non-existence, God, of course, did not become finite. All the fullness of life and of infinity have remained in Him. But this fullness of life and infinity are also expressed in creatures, living and organic, which are innumerable, and which are all endued with life. The world, and especially the man, are finite. The world is only a point of rest for corporeal creatures, in order that they should not disappear into infinity. The Holy Scriptures speak more truly and more clearly of the world than the world itself, or the arrangement of the earthly strata. The Scriptures of nature within it, being dead and voiceless, cannot express anything definite. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Were you with God when he created the universe? Who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord, or being his counsellor, hath taught him? And yet you geologists boast that you have understood the mind of the Lord in the arrangement of the strata, and maintained it in spite of holy writ. You believe more in the dead letters of the earthly strata, in the soulless earth, than in the divinely inspired words of the great prophet Moses, who saw God. You do not understand how the saints in heaven can hear us when we pray to them. 
but how do the rays of the sun bend down from heaven to us, lighting everything throughout the earth? The saints in the spiritual world are like the rays of the sun in the material world. God is the eternal life-giving sun, and the saints are the rays of this wise sun. As the eyes of the Lord are constantly looking upon the earth and upon terrestrial beings, so also the eyes of the saints cannot but turn towards the same direction as the provident gaze of the Lord of all creatures towards where their treasures, their bodies, their works, the holy places, and the persons devoted to them, are to be found. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You know how quickly, how far, and how clearly the heart can see, especially the objects of the spiritual world. You notice this in all the sciences, especially in the spiritual ones, where a great deal is adopted by faith only, the vision of the heart. The heart is the eye of the human being. The purer it is, the quicker, farther, and clearer it can see. But with God's saints this spiritual eye is refined, even during their lifetime, to the highest degree of purity possible for man, and after their death, when they have become united to God, through God's grace it becomes still clearer and wider in the limits of its vision. Therefore the saints see very clearly, widely and far. They see our spiritual wants. They see and hear all those who call upon them with their whole hearts, that is, those whose mental eyes are fixed straight upon them, and are not darkened or dimmed when so fixed by unbelief and doubt. In other words, when the eyes of the heart of those who pray, so to say, meet the eyes of those they call upon. This is a mysterious vision. He who is experienced will understand what is meant. Therefore, how easy it is to communicate with the saints. It is only necessary to purify the eye of the heart, to fix it firmly upon a saint known to you, to pray to him for what you want, and you will obtain it. And what is God in reference to sight? He is all sight, all light, and all knowledge. He everlastingly fills both heaven and earth and sees everything in every place. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. A hearty belief in the spiritual world, especially in the all-enlightening and all-life-giving Son, rejoices and vivifies the soul that possesses a pure conscience. Faith ought to reach the eye of the heart, this means that the soul ought to stand as though it were higher than anything sensual, higher than anything carnal, higher than its dark nature, and ought to penetrate with as pure a vision of the heart as possible into the spiritual world. Here it will be happy, for here is its true life, its peace and its joy. This is from experience. Imagination and representation are the vision of the heart, or of the soul, creating or reproducing a certain object. Therefore this vision is rapid, instantaneous, and bears a spiritual character. It is a photograph made by the soul of a certain object. The mind is an artist, taking a photograph from it. If the Lord were not long-suffering, if he were not the lover of men. Would he have borne with our great offenses? Would he have been incarnate? Would he have suffered and died for you? Would he have given you his most pure body and blood, upon which even the angels look with fear and trembling? Would he have saved you from sin and spiritual death so many innumerable times? Had it been otherwise, he would have said, be tormented, if you are so evil by nature. I will not deliver you again, after having delivered you so often before. But now, during all our lifetime, he bears with our innumerable offenses, and still waits for our conversion. 
glorify then his love and long-suffering. Picture to yourself what it would have been without him, without him to save. Horror and trembling fill the soul at the idea of it. But impenitent sinners will indeed be overtaken at the last by God's wrath, in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. End of section 4《Section 5 of My Life in Christ》by St. John of Kronstadt Translated by E. E. Gulioff This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. When you are about to pray to Our Lady, the Holy Virgin, be firmly assured, before praying, that you will not depart from her without having received mercy. To think thus and to have confidence in her is meet and right. She is the all-merciful mother of the all-merciful God, the Word, and her mercies, incalculably great and innumerable, have been declared from all ages by all Christian churches. She is indeed an abyss of mercies and bounties, as is said of her in the canon of Odigitri. Therefore to pray to her without such assurance would be foolish and audacious, for doubt would offend her goodness, just as God's goodness is offended when people pray to Him without hoping to receive what they pray for. How do people hurry for alms to any great and rich man whose kindness is well known and has been proved on many occasions, generally with the most perfect assurance and hope of receiving from Him that which they desire? Likewise in praying, we must neither doubt nor be faint-hearted. As a mother teaches her child to walk, so also God teaches us to have a living faith in Him. A mother will make the child stand and leave it for a while by itself, then she will tell it to come to her. The child cries without its mother, it wants to go to her, but is afraid to attempt to move its feet. It tries to walk, makes a step, and falls down. God teaches the Christian faith in Him in a like manner, faith being the spiritual way. Our faith is as weak, as elementary, as the child beginning to walk. The Lord leaves the man without his help, and gives him up to the devil, or to various distresses and afflictions, and afterwards, when he is in extreme need of help of being delivered from them, for we are not ready to go to him until we are in need of salvation. He bids us look on him. We must absolutely look upon him and come to him for that help. The Christian endeavors to do so. He opens the eyes of his heart, just as the child moves its feet, and tries to see the Lord by means of them. But his heart, not being taught how to see God, is afraid of its own boldness, and stumbles and falls. The enemy and inborn sinful corruptions close the newly opened eyes of his heart and cut him off from God, so that he cannot approach him, though God is near, ready to take him into his arms. Only God must be approached with faith, and an effort must be made to see him fully with the spiritual eyes of faith. Then he will himself stretch out his helping hand, will take the man into his arms, and drive away the enemies. Then the Christian feels that he has fallen into the arms of the Saviour himself. Glory be to thy goodness and wisdom, Lord. Thus during the efforts of the devil against us, and in every affliction, we must see clearly with the eyes of the heart, as if he stood before us, the Saviour, the lover of men, and look upon him with boldness as upon our inexhaustible treasury of goodness and mercies, and pray to him with all our hearts that he may give us a portion of this inexhaustible fountain of blessings and of spiritual help, and we shall immediately obtain what we are praying for. The chief thing is faith, 
or the spiritual vision of the Lord, and the hope of receiving everything from Him, as the most merciful, the most true. This is the truth, this is from experience. By these means God also teaches us to acknowledge our extreme moral infirmity without Him, to be contrite in heart, and constantly in a prayerful frame of mind. The Christian has no reason to have in his heart any ill-feeling whatever against any one. Such ill-feeling, like every other evil, is the work of the devil. The Christian must only have love in his heart, and as love cannot think of evil, he cannot have any ill-feeling against others. For instance, I must not think that any one else is evil or proud without having positive reasons to think so, or I must not think that it will make him proud if I show him respect, or that if I forgive him he will again offend me and will mock at me. We must not let evil in any form nestle in our heart, but evil generally appears in too many forms. The peace and plenteousness of life in the heart after communion is the greatest, the most inestimable gift of our Lord Jesus Christ, surpassing all the gifts relating to the body which are received at the same time. Without peace of the soul, when the heart is straitened and tormented, the man cannot avail himself of any blessings, either material or spiritual. At that time the delights that come from the feeling of truth, goodness, and beauty do not exist for him, because the very center of his life, the heart, or the inner man himself, is crushed and slain. Unite your soul to God by means of hearty faith, and you will be able to accomplish everything. Do powerful, invisible, ever watchful enemies wage war against you? You will conquer them. Are these enemies visible, outward? You will conquer them also. Do passions rend you? You will overcome them. Are you crushed with sorrows? You will get over them. Have you fallen into despondency? You will obtain courage. With faith you will be able to conquer everything, and even the kingdom of heaven will be yours. Faith is the greatest blessing of the earthly life. It unites the man to God, and makes him strong and victorious through him. He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. God in his goodness is granted to us, undeserving as we are, to see the sun and its light and allows us to enjoy it. He will grant to us also to enjoy his own inaccessible light. Let the light of the sun be a pledge to us of this, but especially the tranquil light of the holy glory of the heavenly Father, his only Son, given to us, and the spirit of love bestowed upon our hearts. What do I see when I look upon God's world? I see everywhere the extraordinary breadth, the sportiveness of life in the animal kingdom, amongst quadrupeds, reptiles, insects, birds, and fishes. Now it may be asked, why should there be this narrowness and sorrowful way of life for man, especially for the man who is zealous and pious? God has everywhere plenteously diffused life, abundance, and gladness, and all creatures, with the exception of men, glorify the Creator by their abundance, their life, and sportive joy. Why, then, is there this discordance between me and the general life? Am I not the creature of the same Creator? The solution of this question is simple. Our life is poisoned, either through our own fault by sin, or by the incorporeal enemy, and especially and chiefly by him, in regard to those who have given themselves up to a life of piety. The life of the man, of the true Christian, is in the future, in after ages. There every joy and full blessedness will be open to him. 
but here he is only in exile and is under punishment here sometimes the whole of nature takes up arms against man for his sins not to speak of the enemy from time immemorial who as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour therefore i am not disturbed by the fact that there are joy and abundance everywhere throughout the world while in myself alone there is often no gladness so that i look morosely upon the gladness and freedom of god's creatures i have within me an executioner for my sins he is ever with me and strikes me but there will be joys for me also only not here but in the other world looking upon god's world i see everywhere god's extraordinary bountifulness in the gifts of nature the surface of the earth is like the richest table prepared with abundance and variety by the most loving and generous of hosts the depths of the waters also serve to feed the man what shall be said of the animals quadrupeds and birds and what bountifulness is manifested in providing food and clothes for men the lord's mercies are innumerable look at all the earth's supplies in summer and in autumn every christian especially the priest ought to imitate god's bountifulness let your table be open to everybody like the table of the lord the avaricious is god's enemy the tree firmly fixed in the earth by its roots grows and brings forth fruit the soul of a man firmly fixed in god by faith and love as by spiritual roots also lives grows spiritually and brings forth the fruits of virtue pleasing to god through which the soul lives now and shall live in the future world the tree when uprooted from the ground ceases to live by the life which it received from the heart through the roots similarly the soul of the man which has lost faith and love to god and does not dwell in god in whom alone it can live spiritually dies what the earth is to the plants god is to the soul in order not to be in daily bondage to the passions and the devil you must set yourself an object to aim at have this object constantly in view and endeavor to attain it conquering all obstacles by the name of the lord what is this object the kingdom of god the divine palace of glory prepared for believers from the creation of the world but as this object can only be attained by certain means it also is necessary to have such means at one's disposal and what are these means faith hope and love especially the last believe hope and love especially love disregarding all obstacles love god above everything and your neighbor as yourself if you have not sufficient strength to preserve in your heart these inestimable treasures fall down oftener at the feet of the god of love ask and it shall be given you seek and ye shall find knock and it shall be opened unto you for he who is promised is true walking sitting lying down conversing or working at every time pray with your whole heart that faith and love may be given to you you have not yet asked for them as you should ask fervently and instantly with the firm purpose of obtaining them say now i will begin to do so henceforth when on your way to god you meet obstacles raised up by the devil doubt and unbelief of heart also a thorough ill-feeling sometimes towards persons worthy of absolute respect and love as well as other passions do not be disturbed by them but know that it is but the smoke of the enemy which will be dispersed at a sign from our lord jesus christ what should be our chief care in the education of the young we must chiefly endeavor that the eyes of their understanding should be enlightened 
Do you not notice that our heart acts first in our life and in nearly all our knowledge? The heart sees certain truths, ideas, before the mind knows them. When knowledge is acquired it happens thus. The heart sees at once, indivisibly, instantaneously. Afterwards the single action of the sight of the heart is transmitted to the intellect and subdivided in the intellect into parts or sections, preceding and subsequent. The sight of the heart is analyzed in the intellect. The idea belongs to the heart and not to the intellect, that is, to the inner man and not to the outer one. Therefore, to have the eyes of their understanding enlightened is a very important matter in inquiring all knowledge, but especially in that of the truths of faith and of the laws of morality. The future life is the perfect purity of the heart, which is now only gradually purified, and which is at present more often shut and darkened by sin and by the devil's breathing into it and only at times, under the influence of God's grace, brightens and sees God, being united to Him most truly during prayer and in the sacrament of the Holy Communion. How should we keep the festivals? We must celebrate in them either the event, with a view of investigating the greatness of the event, its object, and the fruits it brought to those who believe, or the person, as, for instance, our Lord, the Mother of God, the angels and saints, with the view of investigating the relation of that person to God and to mankind and his beneficial influence upon God's church in general. It is necessary to investigate the history of the event or of the person whose festival we solemnize, to approach it or him with our whole heart, to absorb them, so to say, into ourselves. Otherwise the festival will be incomplete and not pleasing to God. The festivals ought to influence our life, to vivify and kindle our faith in future blessings, and maintain in us a pious and gentle disposition. Yet they are mostly spent in sin and folly, and met with unbelieving cold hearts, often wholly unprepared to feel the great mercies which God has vouchsafed to us through the particular event or person whose festival is celebrated. It may happen that there is much wickedness in your soul, but let it be known to God alone, who knows everything that is secret and concealed, and do not show all your uncleanness to others. Do not corrupt them by the breath of the wickedness concealed within you. Tell God your grief, that your soul is full of wickedness, and that your life is near to hell. But to other people show a bright and pleasant countenance. What have they to do with your madness? Or declare your soul's sickness to your confessor or to a true friend, so that they may teach you, guide you, and restrain you. Gazing upon heaven, contemplate in its heights the Lord Jesus, for it was from there that he appeared to the pro-martyr Stephen and to Saul, and prayed to him to save you. These appearances of his do not show that he only then opened the heavens and looked down upon these saints through the heavens thus opened, but they show that he is always looking down from the heavens upon us all, and sees our actions, words, thoughts, and intentions, as you must have been convinced on many occasions from your own experience, when you lifted up your eyes to the heavens, and received miraculous and great help from Him. It only means that, in the above-mentioned cases, He revealed Himself, and manifested Himself in the heavens." to sin is both detrimental and foolish for the sinner despises himself and either turns away from human society or seeks the society of others like him because his inner condition and the worm gnawing at his heart make any respectable society oppressive to him 
as it does not correspond with the character of his own life. The sinner feels straitened in God's wide world, because the world is the work of the most holy and righteous God, and the sinner who does not obey God's laws, the laws of love and peace, is an outcast from God's creation, for whom there is no place in the world. The reason why he feels so straitened is that he is pursued by God, by his own conscience, and by all creation. Who is it that suffers through doubting, unbelieving, blasphemous thoughts, the object of which the man doubts, in which he does not believe, and which he blasphemes, or the man himself, who doubts, does not believe, and blasphemes? The latter. He grows afraid with the fear of which the psalmist speaks. There were they brought in great fear, even where no fear was. He is tortured by his doubt, unbelief, and blasphemy, whilst the object of his agony remains firm, immovable, and is evidently the better of him, because it makes him change his mind for the sake of his own tranquillity and does not allow him to grow quite calm until he has repented of his former false opinions and has accepted more favorable and truer ones. Therefore it is foolish to waver and be disturbed, and still more so to become faint-hearted and fall into despondency when during prayer, or at any other time, doubting, unbelieving, blasphemous thoughts occur to you. They are all only enticements of Satan." Malice, or any other passion that has taken root in your heart, has a tendency, in accordance with the infallible law of evil, to discharge itself outwardly. This is why it is usually said of an evil or angry man that he has vented his anger upon another person or upon another object. It is the worst of evil that it does not remain in the heart, but tries to diffuse itself outwardly. From this it is already evident that the author of evil is great himself, and has a wide domain over which he reigns. The whole world lieth in wickedness. Like a vapor or gases that have accumulated in a great quantity in a shut-up place strive to rush out, so also the passions, like the breathing of the spirit of evil, having filled the heart, strive to rush out of one man to pour themselves into others, and corrupt, by their ill odor, the souls of others. God has granted us existence, the greatest gift of His goodness, and after we had fallen away from Him, from life into death, He gave us for our regeneration, to bring us back to life, His Son. How small in proportion are all the other gifts which we ask of him in prayer, and how easy it is for him to give them to us at the first word of true faith, if they are really necessary for us. Therefore it is perfectly unpardonable in us if we still doubt that we shall obtain what we ask of God in prayer. The Lord said plainly, Ask, and it shall be given you. Here in this world of vanities, in this adulterous and sinful world, our souls and bodies are continually and often imperceptibly corrupted by moth and rust, and thieves, mental ones, break through and steal the treasures of the soul, that is, righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. What is, then, the true remedy against the continual, sinful corruption of these mental thieves? The prayer of repentance and of faith. It revives and vivifies our souls, corrupted by seductive carnal desires, and drives away the mental thieves. It is a scourge for them, whilst for us it is the source of power, life, and salvation. Glory to God for this! Prayer protects and delivers us from sin. It is good for us to live with the prayer of faith in our hearts, for during prayer we live with the Lord, who has promised all good things to those who ask Him. Ask, 
and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Glory to thee, Lord, for thy most true words. Lord, grant to all those who ask of thee, through my unworthy means, the various blessings, the petitions of their hearts. Amen. So be it. If you wish that God should speedily give you hearty faith in prayer, strive with all your heart to speak and to do everything in regard to other people sincerely, and never be deceitful in your dealings with them. If you are straightforward and truthful with others, then God will give you straightforwardness and sincere faith also in reference to himself. Him who is not straightforward in his dealings with other men, God does not accept easily when he prays, making him feel that he is insincere with other men, and therefore cannot be perfectly sincere with God. Man subjected to passions, what is it that you want? Life, you say. About what do you busy yourself? Life. But are you leading the true life? Both reason and experience oblige you to say that you are not. Then what constitutes your life? Reason and experience again tell me faith, hope, and love. The life of the soul is God a living faith in him, and love to other men like unto myself. These are the peace and breadth of my heart, for without them I am the martyr of sin, the slave, the prisoner of passions, and my life is spent in affliction and constraint. Even here I rest in Christ and with Christ. How, then, can I do otherwise than believe that eternal rest in him awaits me after death, and after the struggle against earthly enemies. Here without Christ I feel oppressed and in pain. How can I do otherwise than believe that it will be still more grievous to be without Christ there, when he will finally cast me away from before his face? Thus the present state of our souls foreshadows the future, the future will be a continuation of the present inward condition, only in a modified form as to its degree. For the righteous it will be turned into the fullness of eternal glory, for sinners into the fullness of everlasting torment. It is good for me to draw near to God, said David, who had tasted the sweetness of prayer and praising God. Other men confirm this, and I a sinner also. Observe, even here on earth, to draw near to God is a good and blessed thing. While we are yet in the sinful flesh, which has much that is agreeable and disagreeable in itself. Therefore, what blessedness it will be to be united to God there, in heaven and the blessedness of union with God here on earth is a specimen and pledge of the blessedness of union with God after death, in eternity. You see, then, how good, merciful, and true the Creator is. In order to assure you of the future blessedness proceeding from union with Him, He allows you to experience the beginning of this blessedness here on earth, when you approach him sincerely. Yes, even here, my invisible soul rests in the invisible God. Therefore, it will still more perfectly rest in him when it is separated from the body. The spirit is powerful, mighty, and therefore it easily bears a heavy substance, while the flesh is inert, feeble, and is therefore easily overwhelmed by its own natural substance. This is why God, by the word of his power, upholds all things. Similarly, the spirit of a man, blessed with grace, by God's help, easily conquers his own flesh, and even the flesh of others, as we see in the saints, easily masters during prayer the meaning of the words, 
filling them with his spirit, whilst the carnal man is in constant subjection to his flesh, is oppressed by the words of the prayer, which he is unable to endue with the spirit, being flesh himself, or is unable to penetrate into its pure, holy spirit with his own impure, carnal spirit. Man is constantly perishing through sin, and therefore he requires a constant daily Saviour. This Saviour is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Only call upon him inwardly with living, clear-seeing faith in your salvation, and he will save you. Thus has he miraculously saved me an innumerable number of times. This salvation was as manifest as, for instance, the visit of any deliverer to a prison from which he frees the prisoner. It is necessary for a priest to experience himself the power of faith, the sweetness of prayer, and the remission of sins, and also to experience cases when prayer is unsuccessful, as well as spiritual afflictions and the consolations of grace, so that in his prayer to God for the faithful he may say thus, Give unto them the same blessings as those which thou always givest to my unworthy self, and so that he may be able to pray about everything from his own experience. He is near to his heart, is said of two persons of unequal rank, one of whom protects the other, and the one who has been honoured by the protection of the higher person, and by being near to his heart, knows this, and is reciprocally near him in his own heart. It is thus between God and those who serve him with a pure heart. God is always near to their heart, and they are near God's heart. It should also be the same during the prayer of every Christian. When praying we must absolutely be near to God in our heart. All that is good and sincere in our intercourse with our fellow men should be transferred to God. Remember that you are always walking in the presence of the sweetest Lord Jesus. Say to yourself oftener, I wish so to live that my life may gladden my beloved, crucified for my sake on the cross. Above all, I will take for the companion and friend of my life my holy beloved, who instills everything into my heart, making me thirst for the salvation of all, rejoicing with those who rejoice, and weeping with those who weep. This will especially comfort my comforter. Christ. Parents and teachers, beware, and be most careful not to let your children be capricious, otherwise they will soon forget to value your love. Their hearts will be corrupted with wickedness. They will soon lose holy, true, glowing love from their hearts, and on reaching maturity they will complain bitterly that in their youth you spoiled them too much and encourage them in their caprices. Capriciousness is the germ of the corruption of the heart, the rust of the heart, the moth of love, the seed of evil, and an abomination to the Lord. In the church especially is accomplished the mystery of the cleansing from sins. Reverence therefore the place where your soul is cleansed from all impurities, where you are reconciled to God, where you receive the true life of the Spirit. How many times the Lord has here granted me the cleansing from my sins, without which I could not have enjoyed God's gifts, the greatest of life's gifts, the gifts of peace and joy and earthly blessings besides. Glory to Thee, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Nothing is more changeable than matter. It changes into millions of forms, by natural means, according to the laws of the Creator. Not to speak of the wonderful changes, for instance, of fire into dew, 
of water into blood, of water into wine, of the rod into the serpent. Even man sometimes changes matter into a thousand different forms. What can therefore be said of God, who has created everything? The nature of matter is its changeableness. God does not act thus, and does not desire to act thus with a reasonable spirit. The nature of the spirit is its unchangeableness. But to strive to become perfect in good works is the act of a reasonable created spirit. It is the triumph of the spirit over matter that the spirit changes it into thousands of forms. Notice, for instance, how this spirit changes matter in the vegetable kingdom. How endlessly varying are the forms of plants, all growing out of the same soil, with the help of the same light of the sun, the same air, and the same water. In the bodies of animals, how varied they are. Thus the nature of matter is changeableness. Upon this condition the world was created in all its variety. Glory to the only eternally unchangeable God, the all-powerful Creator. Had matter been unchangeable, then God would not have been all-powerful. Glory to the spiritual nature. May it ever conquer the material nature. Ask God to give you unchangeableness in all that is good. Why is it that we always remember the offenses of men, are angry and bear malice against the offenders, whilst the most wicked, the most hurtful and continual offenses of the devil we very soon forget, even though we have been thus offended by him a thousand times a day, while we bear in remembrance the offenses of men sometimes for longer than a day. This is the enticement of the devil. He knows how to deceive us cleverly, whilst defending us himself, he ever screens himself behind our own self-love, as though wishing to gratify us in the beginning by means of the development of a certain passion, though afterwards he always destroys, and bitterness comes to us from him for our foolish, unreasonable self-love. The offenses of other people against us he always magnifies a hundredfold, representing them in a false light, and here again he screens himself behind our own self-love, as though he were jealous of our welfare, which other people are seeking to destroy by their offenses. Two forces, in direct opposition to each other, influence us, one good, the other evil, one life-giving, and the other deadly. As both are spiritual forces, both are invisible. The good power, through my free and sincere prayer, always drives away the evil power, which is strong only through the evil concealed within me. In order not to be subjected to the continual harassments of the evil spirit, we must constantly have in our hearts this prayer to Jesus Christ. Jesus, Son of God, have mercy upon me. Against the invisible one, the devil, the invisible God. Against the mighty, the mightier. End of section 5